Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher, or The Murder at Roadhill House by Kate Summerscale. Dane reads. So this is non-fiction, investigates a crime in Victorian England, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to read you the blurb, then we're going to go through, check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, it is midnight on the 30th of June 1860, and all is quiet in the Kent family's elegant house in Road, Wiltshire. The next morning, however, they wake to find that their youngest son has been the victim of an unimaginably gruesome murder. Even worse, the guilty party is surely one of their number. The house was bolted from the inside. As Jack Witcher, the most celebrated detective of his day, arrives at Road to track down the killer, the murder provokes national hysteria at the thought of what might be festering behind the closed doors of respectable middle-class homes. Scheming servants, rebellious children, insanity, jealousy, loneliness and loathing. This true story has all the hallmarks of a classic gripping murder mystery. A body, a detective, a country house steeped in secrets and a whole family of suspects. It is the original Victorian who done it. So, we have lots of cool stuff like maps of the place and stuff to help bring it alive. Even photos, which are very cool. I'm going to start with this note on money here because this is kind of helpful. It says, in 1861, one pound had the purchasing power of 65 pound in today's money. A shilling was worth a 20th of one pound and had the purchasing power of about three pound 25 today. A penny was worth a 12th of a shilling and had the purchasing power of about 25 modern pence. This measure, based on the retail price index, is useful for calculating the relative cost of everyday items such as fares, food, drink. When assessing salaries, a more meaningful calculation is that an income of 100 pounds in 1860 is the equivalent of about 60,000 pounds today. And yeah, that makes no sense because if one pound is 65 pounds, 100 pounds should be 6,500, not 60,000. But, um, I mean, I guess, whatever. So Witcher sets off and we get, even the penny a mile train which Witcher took seems to skim across the flat country to Slough and glide over the broad arches of the railway bridge at Maidenhead. And those are both very near to where I am now. I think they're both within 10 miles, maybe five. Uh, also, every time I think Mr. Witcher, I just think of Gerald of Rivia. It would be great if... And so here we get the discovery of the corpse. As Thomas Benger lifted Savile's body from the privy, the boy's head tipped back to expose the clean cut through his neck. Its little head fell off almost, said William Nutt, when he gave his account of the day's events in the Wiltshire Magistrates Court. His throat was cut, said Benger, and blood was splashed over his face. He was a little dark about the mouth and eyes, but he looked quite pleasant and his little eyes were shut. Pleasant here meant peaceful. Just an interesting little bit in terms of the language used here. Mrs. Dallimore strip searched the female servants, but on Foley's instructions, did not ask the women of the Kent family to disrobe. Instead, she examined their nightdresses. She found bloodstains on the nightdress of Mary Ann, the eldest daughter, so she passed it on to the police. They showed the garment to Parsons, who attributed the stains to natural causes. Stapleton agreed that the blood was menstrual. The nightgown was nonetheless given to Mrs. Dallimore for safekeeping. And we get this bit. <laughs> I think this is such an insensitive thing to say. The other mystery was the lack of blood. A sufficient quantity of blood has not been accounted for, reported Parsons, as would have flowed from the body if the throat were cut in the closet, as blood from the arterial vessels would have produced a greater quantity of sparkles on the walls. If the boy's throat had been cut while he was alive, the pulsations would have thrown out jets of blood. Yet the blood was no longer in his body either. The internal organs, said Parsons, were completely drained. The two doctors found Samuel Kent in tears when they returned to the library. Stapleton comforted him, assuring him that Savile had died swiftly. Parsons confirmed this. The child suffered much less than you will. Jesus. Welcome to your bedside manner, mate. Here's a little bit about the police force, and just bear in mind here, Robert Peel became a Prime Minister, but he was also born in Tamworth, and uh, that was his constituency, and that's the, the place where I grew up. The Metropolitan Police Force, the first such force in the country, was eight years old. London had got so big, so fluid, so mysterious to itself, that in 1829, its inhabitants had, reluctantly, accepted the need for a disciplined body of men to patrol the streets. The 3,500 policemen were known as Bobbies and Peelers, after their founder, Sir Robert Peel. As coppers, they caught or copped villains. As crushers, they crushed liberty. As Jenny Darmies, from gendarmes. And as pigs, a term of abuse since the 16th century. And this is a little bit of context of what was expected of the police force at the time, it says. He was subject to spot checks by a sergeant or an inspector, and the rules were strict. No leaning or sitting while on the beat, no swearing, no consorting with servant girls. The police were instructed to treat everyone with respect. The drivers of hansom cabs, for instance, were not to be referred to as cabbies and to avoid the use of force. These standards were to be observed off duty too. If found drunk at any time, a constable was issued with a warning and if the offence was repeated, he was dismissed from the force. In the early 1830s, four out of five dismissals of a total of 3,000 were for drunkenness. And I like this little excerpt. This shares some of the different like terms for the different crimes at the time. 
Holborn teamed with tricksters, and the police of E-Division had to be experts in identifying them. A new vocabulary evolved to catalogue the various deceits. The police watched out for magsmen, conmen such as carb sharps, who gammoned, fooled, flat, dupes, with the help of butners or bonnets, accomplices who drew people in by seeming to win money from the magsmen. A screever, drafter of documents, might sell a fakeman to a vagrant on the blob, telling hard luck stories. In 1837, 50 Londoners were arrested for producing such documents, and 86 for bearing them. To work the kinchin lay was to trick children out of their cash or clothing. To work the shallow was to excite compassion by begging half-naked. To shake lurk was to beg in the guise of a shipwrecked sailor. In November 1837, a magistrate noted that some thieves in the Holborn area were acting as decoys, feigning drunkenness in order to distract police constables while their friends burgled houses. This was interesting uh, because it goes into semantics and the origins of words, which is something I always nerd out on. The word clue derives from clue, spelled C-L-E-W, meaning a ball of thread or yarn. It had come to mean that which points the way because of the Greek myth in which Theseus uses a ball of yarn, given to him by Ariadne, to find his way out of the Minotaur's labyrinth. The writers of the mid-19th century still had this image in mind when they used the word. There is always a pleasure in unravelling a mystery, in catching at the gossamer clue which will guide to certainty, observed Elizabeth Gaskell in 1848. I thought I saw the end of a good clue, said the narrator of Andrew Forrester's The Female Detective, 1864. William Wills, Dickens' deputy, paid tribute in 1850 to Witch's brilliance by observing that the detective found the way even when every clue seems cut off. I thought I had my hand on the clue, declared the narrator of The Woman in White in an instalment published in June 1860. How little I knew then of the windings of the labyrinth which was still to mislead me. A plot was a knot, and a story ended in a denouement, an unknotting. And this is interesting too, I've heard this like legend used before on various stories and whatnot, I'm sure you have as well. It says, on the same day the Bristol Daily Post, founded that year, printed a letter from a man who believed that an examination of Savile's eyes might reveal the image of his killer. The correspondent based his suggestion on some inconclusive experiments conducted in the United States in 1857. The image of the last object seen in life remains printed, as it were, on the retina of the eye, he explained, and can be traced after death. According to this hypothesis, the eye was a kind of daguerreotype plate, registering impressions that could be exposed like a photograph in a darkroom. Even the secrets locked up in a dead eye might be within the reach of the new technologies. This took to an extreme the way the eye had been turned into the symbol of detection. It was not only the great detector, but also the great giveaway, the telltale organ. The letter was reprinted in newspapers all over England. Few treated it with scepticism. The Bath Chronicle, though, dismissed its usefulness to the case on the grounds that Savile was asleep when the killer struck, so there could be no image of the murderer on his retina. Yeah, that's why it wouldn't work. And this is just mad stuff. This is, again, more of the sort of societal background and backdrop to when this case took place. Criminal children were nearly always ill-used children. In Witcher's first weeks in Holborn, he saw many examples of the careless or vicious ways in which parents could treat their young. His colleague, Stephen Thornton, arrested a drunken crossing sweeper, Mary Baldwin, alias Brian, a member of the most notorious family in St Giles, who was seen trying to kill a three-year-old daughter. She put the child in a bag and dashed it violently against the pavement. When a passerby heard the girl's cries and remonstrated with the mother, Mary Baldwin ran into the road to place the bag in the path of an omnibus. The child was rescued by some of the passengers. Jesus. And this is the common consensus and which I personally would have assumed was the motive, although we later find out probably wasn't. There was a consensus that sex was the motive for the murder, more particularly that the catastrophe sprang from the fact that a child had witnessed a sexual transgression. In Witcher's view, Constance avenged the sexual affair between her father and her former governess by destroying the offspring of that liaison. In the popular view, it was Savile who witnessed a sexual encounter and was killed for what he saw. And here we get a uh, I'm just going to read this along with a footnote. So, women accused of murder often pleaded insanity in the hope that the courts would treat them with leniency. And it would have been easy for Constance or her representatives to argue that she'd been afflicted by homicidal monomania when she killed her brother. And the footnote says, To demonstrate the weird logic of homicidal monomania, Stapleton recounted a horrible story about a mild-mannered young man who was so obsessed with windmills that he would gaze at them for days on end. In 1843, friends tried to distract him from his fixation by moving him to an area with no mills. There, the windmill man lured a boy into a world then killed and mutilated him. His motive, he explained, was the hope that as punishment he would be taken to a place where there just might be a mill. Here we get this case as well of um, somebody claimed to be a, like a long lost heir to a family fortune. The Dowager Lady Tichborne greeted the claimant as her son. Friends, acquaintances, former servants also signed documents testifying to his identity. Even the family doctor insisted that this was the man he had attended since boyhood, right down to his peculiar genitals. When flaccid, the penis withdrew into the body like that of a horse. 
Yet many others who had known Sir Roger derided the claimant as an inept imposter. In some respects, his knowledge was remarkable. He noticed that a painting at the Tichborne estate had been cleaned during his absence, for instance. But he made elementary errors too, and had somehow forgotten every word of his first language, French. Ooh la la. And just this final bit I want to read out here, a little bit about Charles Dickens, and because he died with a, an un unfinished murder mystery in progress. So we have, Charles Dickens died in 1870, leaving an unfinished work, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. By dint of its author's death, this novel became the purest kind of murder story, the kind whose tension was never dissolved. Alone, perhaps, among detective story writers, he never lived to destroy his mystery, wrote G.K. Chesterton. Edwin Drood may or may not have really died, but surely Dickens did not really die. Surely our real detective liveth and shall appear in the latter days of the earth. For a finished tale may give a man immortality in the light and literary sense, but an unfinished tale suggests another immortality, more essential and more strange. So yeah, overall the suspicions of Mr. Witcher by Kate Summerscale did enjoy this. I think you're going to enjoy it more if you're a fan of true crime or and or Victorian England. Like luckily I find both very interesting. I did think to begin with maybe this was going to be a bit heavy going and that it would have to be one of my bedtime reads that I read a little bit of a time before I go to sleep. But um, actually it was very engaging. I just read it as my main book, kind of powered through it. So I gave it a 4 out of 5 and would recommend. I also plan to watch, there's a TV mini-series uh, based on this. Um, which I didn't know about, I just knew about the book, you know? But uh, a Hungry Bookworm was talking about it on, on Instagram, she uh, sent me a direct message. And uh, I found out that Paddy Considine plays the title role in it, and Paddy Considine is one of my favourite uh, actors. I actually usually say him when asked in like, you know when you're asked like, which actor would you like to play the life story of you? I normally say Paddy Considine, so I'm gonna check that out. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher by Kate Summerscale. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.